for the introductions. And yeah, welcome everybody again to the webinar. Very excited that you're here. This is a topic that Rohan and I are both very passionate about. So hopefully the next uh, 40 minutes or so, uh, there's a lot to learn. And uh, yeah, keep the questions coming. We'll wait till the end, start going sequentially through the questions. Uh, and so if you have any sort of questions or comments, please, please add them. So who are these two people talking at with you today? Uh, so first, I'm Robbie Lockman. Uh, I'm an evangelist at Harness. Uh, in my background, I worked at a few firms. I worked at IBM, Red Hat, and Mesosphere. And so distributed systems uh, is my game. I had way too many outages, blew the error budget. Now I was told I can't touch production anymore. And this is where I met my friend Rohan. Rohan, let me tell the folks a little bit about yourself. Hey guys, uh, Rohan Gupta here. Um, I was a software engineer at GE. I worked at, on the CI CD tool uh, internally. And then, you know, my journey kind of took me to Harness. We love CI CD here, obviously. And, um, you know, I was a solution architect. So I really helped, you know, users adopt the products and really learned about CI CD and governance along the way. And I kind of fell in love with this topic as we were you know, uh, exploring the space. And uh, now I'm a product manager and uh, get to enable all of us to, you know, build cool things with our product and be able to deploy seamlessly. Now, yeah, awesome, Rohan. And so what are we going to be talking about today? So we have four main topics we're going to kind of cover. Uh, just as a level set, one is continuous delivery. So we're just uh, not talking in the ether. A little bit about introductions to what even is a policy and then the genesis of OPA and what is OPA. And then for the fun stuff, uh, open policy agent and continuous delivery better together. So we'll walk you through a few use cases that we've seen and also some of the art of the possible. And then also, uh, we also participate in another Linux foundation, sub foundation, which is part of the CNCF, the Continuous Delivery Foundation, uh, a lot of acronyms there, but also, a lot of the work that we're doing in the CDF is helping everybody uh, leverage continuous delivery, and so hope how also how you can get started and uh, join the CDF. So, continuous delivery. What is continuous delivery? So, continuous delivery. Here's one of the the always a big fan of books. Uh, there'll be a couple books throughout the presentation, but here here is one of the most quintessential pieces about continuous delivery. It is named continuous delivery uh, by Jez Humble and David Farley. And so basically, uh, continuous delivery is all about getting to production safely. Uh, the key word there is safely. In my career, I've gone to production a lot. Uh, sometimes it hasn't been very safe or people will question that wasn't very repeatable or that's a very bespoke, bespoke process. Uh, but continuous delivery is about making sure that how, the path to production where your customers are, so your internal or external customers, is a safe and repeatable path. And that's it, right? So it's easier said than done, but we can get into how this is actually a little bit tricky. That because like all of us, so there's no one path to software. And so let me show you what I call the lifeblood of an application. Uh, I like I like donuts. So in this case, the donut is an application, uh, but similar to medieval times, the humors or humoruses, uh, there's typically four humors to power an application. So clearly an application needs some these resources. Uh, an application will need compute resources uh, it needs to run somewhere. So at some point, you'll need some sort of durable storage, either house the application binaries or data. So you need storage. Uh, networking, it's like if uh, a tree fell in the woods, uh, can you hear it? Uh, an application that doesn't have any sort of connectivity, this is an application. Uh, and then also your application needs application infrastructure. So if you take a look at the CNCF landscape, there's you know thousands of cards out there that these particular projects are coming up that will help power the next generation of cloud native applications. Or if you're not using cloud native, that's some sort of application infrastructure that will help you power this delicious donut. And so let's talk about what it actually looks like when we call a CI CD pipeline or a continuous delivery pipeline. So I call this all in the pipeline, right? And so basically there's multiple steps in just dropping a binary into production. Now, some of the newer mindsets out there is, you know what? Maybe we only have one particular manifest or one particular resource you have to drop, but that's it. There's a lot of rigor that goes into making sure our changes are sane and making sure that our changes are safe. And usually there's this two right end of the radio dial. On the left, with these earlier stages, you need to enable innovation, right? So there'll be a lot of iteration going on. Uh, if you watch how I write software, it's actually kind of dirty. I, I try and try and try and try and try until I get you know, get it right. And that's probably, you know, a number of times or too many uh, to get something right. But also you don't want to be keep trying as you get to production. Your confidence needs to increase 
uh, in each sequential step uh, that, hey, we're building more confidence. So by the time you get to production, uh, there's not a particular, uh, your, your change failure rate's low. Uh, so going back from left to right, hey, you know what, in dev, uh, orchestrating such things as a code analysis, uh, maybe uh, what I've written, I want to make sure that those functions are right, some new unit test. And then maybe uh, I'll pretend throughout the example that Rohan and I are in the same team, which we are, uh, that what I wrote works with what Rohan wrote, or vice versa. Usually it's um, the troublemaker and the two. Uh, kind of getting into now, we're, we're, at, we're infrastructure aware in that middle stage, right? So we've deployed it somewhere. We want to make sure that we didn't do any detriment to the infrastructure. Uh, we're running smoke and soap tests uh, and performance tests. And then as we get to production, uh, we're actually leveraging safe approaches, such as a canary release. Um, and I'll explain what a canary release is really quickly. Uh, but uh, really core to this delivery is making sure that safety is there, right? So is that one and done? A lot of times we're not deploying something for the first time. Uh, the re reason why this is so important is if it was like version one and we're rolling out version one, like who cares? <laughs> but if it's like anything else, you have to make a change, uh, making sure that your users aren't impacted uh, becomes a big business. So really quickly about a Canary deployment. Uh, so basically going through the journey of what a Canary is, if you're unfamiliar with the Canary deployment, it's an incremental release. And so here the user is represented by a taco, love food. Uh, and basically, so let's say you are the user and this delicious taco, uh, through the magic of load balancing, we're running incremental releases. So in the application versions here, the, let's say Chunky Otter is version 1.0 and the Canary is version 1.1. Uh, with the first incremental release, um, it basically you're making sure that the canary survives, right? So, like in this particular version, uh, we have we deployed 33% of the canary, and then still stable as two chunky otters. In the sequential pass, when we determine everything is, is correct, uh, we promote the canary to 100% of the traffic and chunky otters no more. But this is an oversimplified example. Lots of times, canaries have you know, multiple phases, and there's very bespoke rules on how to uh, deploy them. Uh, lastly, uh, before we get into what a policy is, uh, I, I like to always bring up the confidence trivecta, right? And, and this is a, a rationale for why do you have a policy? Why do you even enforce anything? And so in, in the DevOps moniker, you always hear people, process, technology, right? So these three war chants. But let's talk about, let's break this down. Where are actually you the least confident? Well, let's start with technology. It's actually fairly, you know, I would say, not, uh, it's fairly objective, not subjective, to be confident in technology. For example, I have a Kubernetes cluster, and there's a reason I have five worker nodes on that Kubernetes cluster, because I can take two concurrent failures of, of a particular application, right? So I'm fairly confident in my distributed system design that I have a robust and resilient piece of infrastructure. Check, that, that is, that is uh, objective. Where it gets a little bit more subjective uh, and extremely subjective is it, it's more the process can be subjective, right? So certain industries uh, have more stringent change management processes because you know why? The people we're as people we're emotional uh, and we're extremely subjective, right? So where do you have the most confidence? Uh, we're going to by using something like OPA, we're able to blend all three. So you're able to have a process that is confident. You're technically confident in the process, and also because of the people who are authoring it. Uh, you self-enforce the policy, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But that brings us to the next word, a policy. So what is exactly a policy? Uh, I have a Geico insurance policy on my car, uh, but these policies are just a little bit different. So a, a textbook definition of a policy, it's a deliberate systems and principles and goals to force a rational outcome, right? So a policy might be, you know, you have to be 21 to drink because, you know, you, you might make bad decisions if you're not 21. Or uh, in, in computer systems, you know what? Your password must be 25 characters. Uh, my funny story, my sister started a new job and her password had to be 25 characters. Uh, and I was cracking up. I'm like, I can't even think of a 25 character password, but that is a IT security policy that she has to abide by. And so like, really defining the goals and elements of your organization's rules, computer systems, or just uh, principles in general, is a policy, so that is what a policy is. Let's talk about another conundrum that a lot of us are going through, right? If you haven't gone through it yet, you'll go through it soon enough. So here I have my friend Rohan again, as represented by Rick. <laughs> uh, but uh, Rohan is a new uh, site reliability engineer on the team, or he's a new SRE in our product team. 
Now let's take a look at our product stack. Uh, this is a pretty forward thinking uh, product stack. So we are leveraging Kubernetes for the app stack. Uh, so we're leveraging Kafka, we're leveraging uh, several spring projects and we're using CockroachDB as our persistent stack. Uh, and then kind of looking at the non-application stack. Um, so for our observability and monitoring and visualization, uh, we're using Prometheus, we're using FluentD as an aggregator, and then we're displaying everything in Grafana. Cool, right? Like this is a modern application stack. I would say this is a very forward thinking stack and leveraging several projects from the Linux Foundation uh, in our stack. But we have a little bit of a conundrum here. Uh, this is what I like to call Oopsie, this is what I like to call the uh, conundrum. So uh, let's say that we have a problem, right? And so Rohan actually needs more access than what he actually has. And so Rohan being a new site reliability engineer, like let's say, uh, you know, God forbid we have some sort of issue or outage, an incident, I use a more correct term, uh, and Rohan's new to the team, uh, Rohan needs more access. So. In the grand scheme of things, there's a two-part combination. There's authorization and authentication. Authorization would be, does this, uh, does this person, is this person Rohan, right? The answer is yes, you know, we have credentialing, like Rohan has a harness email address and, you know, we have Okta and all that good stuff. So it's like, yes, he, he is who he says he is. Simple, that's solved. But what is not solved in this distributed system problem is can Rohan have elevated access that he needs to get data or to get information uh, for us to have a root cause analysis on these systems? And the answer is no. And if we have to go and make a change for Rohan to get more data or to get higher, let's say, um, author or higher uh, authorization, uh, it's basically I'm redeploying to Kafka, I'm redeploying to the Spring stack, I'm redeploying to Cockroach, I'm redeploying to all of our monitoring observability stack. And so, as you can see, a simple request for you know, we know who Rohan is, but he needs elevator privileges is a problem. And there's lots of deployments that we have to do. And so this is the exact problem that OPA steps into, right? So enter OPA. So regardless if it's our Kafka queue, regardless if it's, you know, our Prometheus stack, regardless if it's the application stack or even, you know, the database stack, uh, Rohan's still here, right? So he's still, you know, he's, he didn't go anywhere. <laughs> he's the same Rohan, but, um, but that's basically it. O OPA acts as a policy agent. And so it focuses on the authorization piece, right? Like, what are you authorized to see? It could be entitlements, it can be the privileged data, but basically OP, OPA sits between, or actually it sits above, depending how you want to look at it, uh, these particular services, because in a modern microservice architecture, uh, you know, as brilliant as microservices are, you're having more endpoints, so you're having more deployments, but kind of that connective tissue uh, is actually communication, right? So. The, the four main benefits, or four big benefits that OPA has is that it si simplifies authorization across your market services. So no matter what service you have, we, we could have doubled the number of services that we had or tripled, um, it's a piece of cake for OPA because it's the central cop between those authorization calls. It uses common remote protocols. So HTTP, uh, HTTPS, uh, also if you're using SSH or uh, gRPC, the OPA understands the particular protocols because OPA um, basically will make a decision on that. And clearly between all of the services, there's some sort of payload, right? Like, you know, it's not, uh, you know, mystery binary <laughs> getting shared <laughs> across or Cobra actually that got removed from the Java spec <laughs> recently, but um, it, it's not a mystery, right? Like it's, it's the payload you can make a decision on. And OPA has this particular uh, particular language called Rego. It's a declarative policy language. So you can say, hey, based on these conditions of this payload, what is the action you want to do? The last big benefit before I hand it over to my brother Rohan is that there's this chicken and the egg question, right? Like it actually solves a very intrinsic question. And usually the answer would be no to this. Uh, take OPA out of the picture. How often as an engineer do you have access to production? Probably not, you know, as a software engineer, right? Well, unless you're like a, let's say a system engineer, infrastructure engineer, a cloud engineer, you, know, you rarely have access to product. There's business controls to separate you away from production because technically if you write it, you can't enforce it, right? If I, if I wrote something, they'll never let me see it in production because you know, I know all the ins and outs and can I be trusted to enforce something? But OPA actually does this, right? OPA actually allows the authors of a system to enforce the system. And so with that, let me turn it over to my friend Rohan to talk about 
how, how do you actually, how can we start leveraging OPA and enforcing certain rules in uh, continuous delivery? Thanks, Ravi. So one thing that we've been seeing, you know, with OPA and in this continuous delivery kind of spaces, how do I centralize, you know, my pipeline deployments in the sense everyone has the ability to kind of configure pipelines and leverage pipelines, but how do I know, you know, who is using what, who is doing what role in this process? Because enforcing a standard pipeline across entire organizations or teams, it's hard, but you know, I might have access to a dev environment. My manager might have access to the prod environment. We might not, just because we know each other really well, or, you know, we have a good working relationship, maybe we, you know, hand off, you know, we, we ease up on the restrictions a little bit. How do we make sure that, you know, the business policies that, you know, our SecOps teams or our operation teams are providing, um, they, they are enforced. They, they, they have some sort of structure in place where, we have that kind of separation of duties. We have that idea of a standard pipeline kind of design. We have the ability to balance between this rigid structure and I, I still care about my developers' freedom. I want them to be able to you know, build pipelines, design pipelines, and also deploy frequently because we also have the job of you know, delivering features at a high velocity for our business. So these are kind of the problems that we, we, we see in continuous delivery, but we also see OPA as a really, uh, as a supplement to this process where we can start putting some structure in place and enforce it uh, in the lower levels. And it's stronger together. And we've seen that because you see as OPA, it's, it's nice uh, as, a, as a, it's rego essentially. So you have the ability to kind of define this as code. You don't have to be the best programmer to figure this out. It's pretty, pretty high level as you don't need to know Java or Python. It's, it's very much just looking through the JSON and kind of picking out which fields you want to enforce because the whole Full communication in OPA is by JSON. So it actually is really helpful for, uh, you know, SecOps and compliance uh, based people because they, they not, might not need to know how to write, you know, Java code or Python code to build a system to kind of enforce their business policies on like a pipeline. It, it's very, it's user friendly, it reads nicely. And you can kind of figure out based off reading it how, what the rule is, what's it gonna enforce. So you as a compliance or SecOps uh, persona would definitely be able to write these rules. And then you can rely on your you know, DevOps team to kind of deploy and enforce these rules. And that in itself enables teams to kind of deploy in a consistent manner that's not only compliant with their business, but it also enables them to have a repeatable, successful kind of process. And as you see here, it's OPA is, you know, designed for Kubernetes. It was, uh, you know, it's really good at managing the config management. It's, it's, it keeps, you know, me from specifying resources that are way too big and I'm not blowing up my cluster every week where I have a bunch of teams deploying into the same namespace and uh, it's starting to make things make a mess in that namespace. So I have to clean it up later. We can really kind of have structure and enforcement around how we deploy our resources in Kubernetes without having such a deep technical understanding of Kubernetes and the underlying you know, behavior of how pods are getting scheduled and who's taking up what resources. We can put guardrails in place so we don't have to deal with those kind of lower level problems. And we see a lot of benefits from it. We, we've seen users really love this kind of granular structure because I don't have to configure the RBAC and all these different systems. I have to configure it at the Kubernetes level. I have to configure it at the Git level. I have to configure it at you know, uh, the, the Grafana level. I have to configure it at the AppD level. Those kind of tools, that's, that's just part of the equation. I could have one system to define it and I can have one system to be the interface for it. That's, that's the, the, the benefit of you know, adopting more of like a policy driven uh, enforcement kind of approach with your software systems. And so some of the problem spaces we can, as you saw in Ravi's earlier slide around 
deploying to your dev environment, deploying to your QA environment, you saw that there was like smoke tests, regression tests, um, there was a, like scans. Those kind of pieces are very, very uh, crucial in your deployment pipeline. So there's two parts to this. One is, you know, OPA, I, I feel if you're familiar with it, a lot of people talk about the RBAC capabilities and it's a very, very powerful tool for that. But I think other pieces of this that OPA can be applicable for is like quality decision and evidence. The reason why is because when you're doing a deployment, you are running your tests, you're running some scans, you're making sure the image doesn't have anything that's vulnerable. But as you, it progresses through the deployment, you lose sight of those pieces of information because you, you just, you're just seeing it, the results and you're just continuing to let the build go through the process. What we want to, what we see is people want evidence that before I say, hey, this app is going to production, I want to see that you've actually hit 90 you know, percent on your unit test. I want to make sure that Sonar Cube gives you a great grade. I want to see that, you know, your Nexus IQ, you did a Nexus IQ scan. I, I also want to see that, you know, when you deployed that canary, it ran for like 50 minutes and I got metrics from it from app dynamics. I want to see all that evidence before I can concretely say, go to, go to production with my deployment. So we, we've seen it. Oh, OPA as like that rule engine where I can collect all that data and, and format it in a JSON format and send it over to my rule engine to dictate, did you meet the score? Is this good enough? And that takes the human element out of it. So I don't have to chase down these things. I have a system pulling it in. And then I have a governing system, which essentially iterates over it and says, hey, you failed or you pass, there's no gray area. You can't <laughs> say, so you can't say, ah, uh, I think this is okay. 89% versus 90%, that's okay. No, we, we, we it's, it's zero one, we, we're either in or out. That's so just that's people, the, right, Rohan? That's, that's, people. A, that's the subjective part <laughs> that's of it. That's a different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we're passing judgment based on evidence and OPA really, really um, enables that with the users. Now, uh, the second piece I mentioned earlier, you know, separation of duties, right? I, I might be, you know, a developer and Ravi will be my manager in this case, right? So I wrote some code and I build it and it triggers off my, in my pipeline. So it starts building, we'll put it through the dev cycle, the QA cycle, and then hopefully promote it to prod. But during that process, you know, I might need Ravi's approval to get to production. And so a lot of you know, regulated businesses don't want the developer to be the one to approve to production because sometimes what we've been seeing is, you know, we're, we're, we're a team, we're, we're friends outside of this. And so sometimes that kind of spills into, you know, our process where we say, Ravi might say, hey, Rohan, uh, I don't have time to approve this to prod. Can you just hit approve and let this go through? I'll, I'll be back later and you know I'm, i trust you because you know we've been working together for five years and and things are I, I i trust your judgment however that doesn't fly when i'm building apps that are like touching you know healthcare data or my financial information or you know my insurance information i don't want to i don't want people i, I want to make sure that the software that you know that i'm 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 consuming as a user actually kind of follows some sort of process. So I can, and that builds trust with, with the user and the consumer. So the separation of duty piece is extremely important because at, in an internal business, they definitely don't want the developer to be the one to approve their own build to production. It, it, that's just not going to fly. And a lot of, you know, compliance uh, officers look at that kind of information in logs to say, in the reports to say, hey, are you guys following a, a good practice to make sure that you know the consumer is protected? Um, and so we see the separation of duties uh, problem come up uh, numerous times. And so we think that you know OPA is an excellent you know uh, solution to this problem because you know I can have a list of approvers um, stored in a kind of a third-party system, and when I get to the point of deployment, 
you can automate the decision making. So Robbie can't let me, you know, approve a prod and go to lunch. You know, he ha- he's got to say, hey, I actually have. I'm the only one who can approve Rohan's build to prod. I this build's gonna hold until I do it, or I have to reject everyone else who's trying to bypass this rule. So OPA is that kind of buffer to say, hey, you can't do this. Only X amount of people can do this. So this might be Ravi. This could be my security team. This could be my my like head of release. Someone else besides myself has to perform this task. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing because I, I've done this uh, numerous times in my development <laughs> days. Um, I I've. I've over provisioned, you know, resources and I've crashed clusters. I still, you know, even when I give demos today, I create some resources and, you know, it crashes the demo environment. And so deployment configuration sanitary is sanitary. This is huge. Like when I deploy my Kubernetes application or my ECS application, uh, how do I make sure that a, the image is not coming from the public Docker hub? I need to take it from like a private S3 bucket or an artifact, like an artifactory, or how do I make sure that the, in the Kubernetes like container spec, I'm not taking a, a massive amount of CPU or memory, um, or how do I make sure that the pod has the right labels so I can track it in my other business systems? OPA, you know, really does a good job of being that buffer because essentially before the deployment, you can catch that whole thing through Gatekeeper and it will check to see, hey, do you meet these kind of criteria? Like you can write rules, like making sure my image is not com- coming from a public repo, making sure CPU is under this amount and making sure memory is under this amount. And what you can see is those rules are being evaluated and you know that you know there's a guardrail in place that as we're going through the CI CD po- process, there's a system checking to make sure that my config actually, you know, it, it matches my criteria at an infrastructure level and even at, at, the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the config level as well, make, making sure the config is sanitary and my infrastructure is, you know, safe. It's, it, it's de-risked because of this kind of governance. We definitely don't wanna do, you know, all our best testing in production. <laughs> <laughs> I get your AWS bill, Rohan. So definitely you're very okay. prone to over provisioning. So thanks for my points for my next vacation, whenever that would be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, was there anything else you want to chat about, about use cases before I introduce the uh, Continuous Delivery Foundation? Um, I, I also wanted to talk about uh, one last piece, which was around uh, the, around like enforcement of in the deployment process, what about like blackout periods, right? How do I make sure that people aren't bypassing those? How do I, and how do I like build a system that, you know, that can enforce that without me having to say, hey guys, you are not deploying on Friday because I don't want to be on call Saturday dealing with this. How can I make sure that, you know, there's a check in place and OPI actually can be leveraged for that as well as like a, like a as a rule engine to say, hey, deployments cannot happen on Friday. Deployments cannot happen on Monday. And so we, we have, you know, deployment configuration uh, is one part of it, but actually the process of deploying that at a higher level can be managed by OPA as well, because at runtime, you can definitely send the system like a check saying, hey, a deployment is starting. And then OPA can say, what's the time, take like the metadata of what the time is, what the date is, and you could very much design like a rule to say, hey, enforce the blackout window. You have to deploy on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You can't deploy on Monday and Friday and reject the deployment. So you have that peace of mind. Again, I talk, I spoke about guardrails. It's extremely uh, valuable kind of as an interface for those guardrail uh, policies that we have in place in our organizations today.
Yeah, and that's perfect. I mean, I think we, you know, Rohan uh, and myself, we talked about, there, there's a lot of rules uh, when going to uh, production, right? There's not just one, you know, past this, there's, there's lots of incremental confidence uh, going back to the technology choices, the process choices, and even the people choices. Uh, you know, how do you enforce that? And OPA is a perfect rules engine for that. You don't have to understand like drools or iLog or some other you know, fancy rules engine. It is, uh, it's simple enough that more people, uh, a wider swath of skill sets can actually implement it. And a lot of what we talked about uh, today, it's, it's ongoing, right? Like it is how do you bode uh, particular rule sets, uh, rule sets that are hard coded or rule sets that have been ingrained deep in a system to something more abstract. And that's a lot of the goals that we're seeing with uh, OPA, Open Policy Agent, and continuous delivery. But uh, depending on where you are, I uh, kind of want to kind of close out with a few points here. Uh, as you're going along your continuous delivery journey, or if you have no idea, again, what continuous delivery is, there is a Linux Foundation sub-foundation to help you out. Uh, so I want to introduce, uh, pay homage to the Continuous Delivery Foundation, aka the CDF, uh, which uh, we're a proud part of. And so basically the Continuous Delivery Foundation, here, here's actually a uh, presentation in a presentation. I actually gave this presentation, uh, the screenshot in the middle um, called, how much should you deploy? And I suffer from something called photo, photo fear of deploying, or actually this is FOD, F-O-D. Uh, but how much should you be deploying, right? And a lot of uh, being in industry, a lot of what we see, uh, you know, if you if you read this, another book, uh, Lean Enterprise, uh, you might see, you know what, I need to be deploying 100 times a day. And then you might Google it, say, am I, am I crazy? How many, how many times a day does a big software firm deploy? And you don't have to be deploying every 12 seconds, right? Like if you're deploying every six months and you get that down to every three months, this is the production, right? You might be deploying to, uh, you know, a, a dev environment 100 times a day, but getting into production, if you're going to cut that in half, you know, from six months to three months, you're incredibly more agile. Uh, leaving with... It's a, new, a neutral home for many of the continuous delivery tools and projects. And so there's several engines out there which Harness participates in. And so if you're looking to get more into the continuous delivery space, um, the CDF is a great place to be organized. Uh, there's several special interest groups and working groups that are out there. So if you wanna participate, um, I participate in a few of them, uh, extremely open and valuable for you to come and learn more or come and participate with your expertise. Uh, but with that, um, if you would like to get a copy of the presentation or learn a little bit more what you learned about today, uh, feel free to hit up this bit.ly or give it a, a QR scan. And so we can actually take a look at what questions have been, uh, been asked now. So let's take a quick look here in the question and answer section or in the chat. So if you have any sort of questions, uh, feel free to ask them. It looks like our question queue is empty. Uh, Rohan and I can answer anything about uh, OPA or about life in general, um, if you need advice, uh, where to eat, you know, we can give you some, some of that too. So don't be shy. Uh, we're, here, <laughs> we're here for y'all. Just give it a few minutes. Rohan, what is your favorite coffee? Mine? Uh, I've been actually playing around with the, <laughs> with Phil's, uh, the Testara one or Tessera. It's been pretty good. I like the mint mojito one. I don't call it coffee. Yeah, oh, the... <laughs> All right, we got some good ones. Okay, how can we attend the slides or the recording? Um, you can hit up this bit.ly link here. I believe the Linux Foundation uh, will publish uh, not too long after uh, the recording. Uh, what is your favorite distribution of Linux, Rohan? Oh man, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I'm a big like, you know, enterprise guy because, you know, I, I started an enterprise. It's very much like Red Hat's distribution of Linux. That's the one that I've kind of learned on and I ride that out. Um, but yeah, that's, that's mine. Robbie, do you have a favorite one? I like Mint. I'm on the Mint Mojito train. I like Mint Linux. It's easy. It's based on Ubuntu, so um, I'm a big fan of a uh, big fan of Mint. Actually, it's on my mother's laptop. I gave it to her. <laughs> Start learning. Uh, let's see. So, is there a demo we could do with Harness and OPA? Um, 
that we actually do have a demo somewhere. We, we had a we have a demo, but I we actually have a lot of uh, blogs that kind of uh, in on our harness site that actually go through how to configure it um, in harness and how a deployment works. Uh, Ravi, actually, uh, our, our colleague Tiff um, wrote new a couple of them, uh, and the team can kind of here can kind of check it out and and see kind of how it works with harness and even outside of harness, just. How, how you could design a rule, how you can apply it to, you know, your Kubernetes cluster, and then you can even test it outside of Harness. Just try running, you know, Gatekeeper and running kubectl with some sample manifests against it, and you'll see kind of how the rule engine behaves. Yeah, perfect. Um, and, and also, yeah, we do, I think her example is really, a really, really eloquent one or a simple one. It was like uh, blocking a namespace that shouldn't have been deployed to, so uh, makes makes perfect sense. Um, so another question, In internally, do you use OPA just for Kubernetes deployments or do we use it for other workflows or what have you seen? So internally, we've been working on some cool things on around, you know, how we could regulate deployments, but also it's, it, we're, we're looking at it more, more, it's more than regulating kind of the cluster. We're, we're focusing more on the rules engine and kind of how we can, you know, make a, make a judgment call based off, off of it. So that, that's kind of where we've been uh, looking more into more than just um, the restriction of deployments because restriction of deployments um, itself, OPA does, does it because it's you know, managing the cluster and the configuration uh, before you actually do the apply. So uh, the, the things that we're kind of looking into are more along uh, making decisions for you. And, and for, for those taking that question one step mm -hmm. further, I think, um, at least for uh, a harness implementation, it's not necessarily restricted to Kubernetes. So, you know, OPA is correct. It, 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 it grew up on Kubernetes, but, uh, you know, a lot of times you might be in between, like, you know, you might, your organization might not leverage Kubernetes or, you know, which is very valid, or you might be having partial apps, right? Like, hey, like 10%, 20% is on K8s. And so just mainly going, just reiterating for what Rohan said, like more, it's actually a very powerful rules engine. So it can be running to orchestrate things and making gear and decisions for pipeline decisions that are eventually the endpoint is a VM or another Linux entrance or bare metal. So yeah, good question. Is there anything else we can answer? Feel free. Well, I think we're all set. Looks like the questions have, uh, have slowed. Um, so yeah, just th thank you everybody for your time uh, today. Either it'd be this morning, this afternoon, this evening. Uh, really, really glad to hear um, these great questions. And uh, yeah, uh, cheers everybody. Great, thank you so much to Ravi and Rohan for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. And we're, we hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.